Greetings, friends, and welcome back to the Musings from the Mount podcast. I'm your host, Joseph Carenza. In a world of constant noise and division, how do we find our center? How can we truly be here now? In this episode of Musings from the Mount, we explore the art of presence in our chaotic times, from navigating digital commons to embracing the power of silence. We offer insights on living mindfully amidst complexity. Join us as we delve into the profound simplicity of being present and discover how this ancient wisdom applies to our modern world. It's time to pause, breathe, and remember we are all part of one unified field. And if you enjoy being in our field and if you enjoy this podcast, please consider going to meditationmount.org and donating. Your donation helps us to bring you this podcast as well as all the other programs that Mount produces both today and in the future. We are incredibly grateful and honored by our support. It's time to be here now and go back to the podcast. Uh, I think it's interesting that many of us have been experiencing the same kind of thing that's sort of, uh, I describe it as almost like a white noise, but it's just the immense amount of data and the immense amount of information and energy that is circulating in the system right now. And if you're a sensitive person, if you're paying attention, if you're being mindful, um, and I can say this for myself, I, it's actually very difficult to be here now, which is sort of what we talked about. And and I thought, you know, of all the different topics we could have, you know, when you suggested it this morning, I was like, this, yeah, this is it. Because how, how do we be here now in this swirl and churn of just intense energy data Um and divisiveness and and you know like how do we navigate this it's interesting joe because the day before we do a podcast one of us usually has an insight of ah right let's do this let's have this topic i remember we we texted each other yesterday evening say hey i'm drawing a blank so am i (laughs) and it was like what's there nothing's there and then you, you you sent some oh here's some possible topics today and i thought well what does the world need to know Is it knowing by more stuff, more information, or is it the deeper knowing of being present in the moment to what is happening? And then I flashed on that wonderful book I bumped into in the 60s by Ram Dass, Be Here Now. And so I'd like to start this podcast off by saying, I am Michael, here and now. Mm. Yeah. And, And it brought me to this understanding of often the data allows us to talk about something but not to be present to what is happening at the deepest levels at the causal levels we wait for it to hit the fan (laughs) or or to show up on the screen and then we react Mm -hmm. what if we are truly in the moment developing a sensitivity to registering the the signals from the deep space of of the the cosmic heart, then stuff is always happening. And the white noise you described is exactly that. It's maybe just not so much interference, but it's it's an overwhelm of information that's like the wall of sound. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Phil Spector in his... his, in his you were the specter yeah. of Phil Spector. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I think that's uh, something that we've all been experiencing. I know, uh, speaking for myself, I just, it's, uh, you know, when you think about being mindful and you think about being here in this moment, but what what's happening when the moment is overwhelming? You know, like, I th- and there's like, you know, it's you almost feel like you're... Um, you're almost checking out by being checked in, you know, like I, I know that sounds kind of silly, but like, it's, it's like a, how do we as mindful beings, as spiritual beings, as people that are on this path, how do we balance that? How do we balance processing and parsing all this data with also just being in this moment and being present? I go back to the image that's often being presented in spiritual um, talks is that stand in the eye of the hurricane, stand mm. in the eye of the storm, 
stand in the higher aspect of yourself, the eye, and the eye of the storm, you're still in the storm, but you're at its still center. Mm -hmm. So the, there's a correlation there. There's a still center in us, us, which is always in touch, which is always present. What throws me off is the spinning. It's, it's the vortices that are, are generated and the swirl and the twisting and the overloading. That's, that's how the storm manifests itself. And, and, and yet, just as we say that silence is the synthesis of all sound and out of the silence comes all music, all sound, so the eye of the hurricane somehow is this place where the thing is held together. So what does it mean to wake up each day and tune into what is happening? Do I go on Twitter? Do I go and look at uh, the latest news flash on my iPhone? How do I how do I know what's happening? Well, I think I have to re I have to know what knowing means. And the more mm. that I understand how I used to know, which was by knowing w the things that were happening, and then that, once that deepens, that becomes a deep knowing, which is a deep participation in this very moment. And I am registering all those signals. Now, my personality may not be stable enough at the time to synthesize and bring forward those signals in some coherent way so everything feels incoherent everything feels like white noise or this great waterfall and yet when i learn to be here now i can be in the world but not of it so it isn't though i have to escape to the eye of the storm i stand in the center of the storm I don't escape from what's happening on the planet. I stand in the center. And the center is that space of awareness, consciousness, thoughtfulness, mindfulness. As we've always said on these podcasts, energy follows thought. Thought is the creative tool that brought everything into being. Therefore, when we're overwhelmed, we're often picking up with this uh, sort of hailstorm of thoughts that are just bombarding us. And yet, we as the thinker can stand in a place where we are part of a greater mindfulness. It isn't just you and I being mindful. What if the planet at the heart of its being is a mindful, sentient entity? How do we enter into the mindfulness? How do we enter into the I of the storm that is currently planet Earth, the deeper dimension of the being that is this planet. Be here now. I think that's really interesting because that there's a practical side to that that I think a lot of people don't feel empowered at this moment, but this is a place where you can actually um, witness your own personal power because you can, you can be online, you can be sort of shouting into the void you know, say, yeah, every, of course, everyone should be able to say what they want online. You should express yourself. But I noticed that, you know, this morning, uh, you know, I scroll through X or Twitter uh, just to kind of take the temperature. And everyone's at, their, everyone's at each other's throats. And it seems like, you know, we're in the brink of civil war. And then I go to the, the grocery store on my way up here. And everyone is just so nice. Everyone's, you know, everyone, no one's talking about politics. Everyone says hi. I talk to the people that I know. Um, and so the difference between the digital and the analog world is, is so um, incredibly, uh, man, it's such a, like a huge, huge canyon of, of, of uh, distance between what's happening online and what's happening in real life. So in this sense, you can really change and people and experience people's energy in a very positive way by just being in the moment and being with your fellow humans and, and experiencing that at the same time. And I think that itself is almost like a walking meditation. You know? Thank you, because each morning I do a walking meditation. Yeah. I actually do a 40-minute walking meditation. Yeah. And, you know, when people see me going around yeah. in this, you know, 
circles, they go, oh my God, how can you do, how you do it is by being here now. One of the things I loved um, as, as a runner, I, I used to take part in 24-hour track races. Mm. We run around the stadium track for 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And people say, how can you do that? The only way to do it is to be in the moment. Otherwise, your mind is going, oh my God, we've got another 20 hours of this. It's hot. Uh, how are we going to make it? Be here now. And then time shifts. Space shifts. Everything shifts. And suddenly, you are standing at the center, you're standing at the eye of the track. Mm-hmm. You're not going round and round and round. Yeah. It's, it's a very different experience. So for me, you talk about going to the grocery store. People are going to the grocery store to get the essentials, the thing, the food they need. Often, when people go onto social media, it's to uh, fill themselves um, to, with the, the foodstuffs that, that bolster their beliefs. Mm. And therefore, yeah. it does become a food fight. <laughs> I like that idea. It is, yeah. That's, so it's, that's what it's a mental Twitter, food fight. That's what Twitter is. It's a mental food fight. Yeah. yeah. So we could use a Twitter and all these other social spaces are exactly that. They're commons. Mm-hmm. The digital commons. Yeah. Now, when you gather at the commons, you gather to, you know, do battle, or do you gather in council? Do you mm. gather in dance? Do you gather in joy? So it's not. There's nothing wrong with the social um, spaces. Mm. We haven't understood the true gift of the commons, mm. and that goes back to. I remember I grew up in England where. Often something was called "Here's the Commons," mm-hmm. um, and it was free. La- it was a free space for everyone to roam. Yeah, we have digital commons now. Can you be present in the commons and allow the deepest aspirations of our humanity to come through, or are we just going to hurl stuff at each other? And maybe we get to a point where then we realize that this is ridiculous. What are we doing? Mm-hmm. So I, I know that the human way of learning seems to be do everything until it doesn't make sense anymore. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, you got to drive it till the wheels fall off, you know. Um, so are the wheels falling off at the moment, Joey? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> it, uh, it, it seems like they're wobbling, you know, and, and we were talking about this, so, so we, we've talked about uh, recalculations. We've talked about great resets. We've talked about all these things, and it seems like that's what we're in. We're in a recalibration, um, or even you could even say an apocalypse. You know, like a, in, in the in the true definition of revelation. Yeah, revelation. Well, that's the thing. How can you make sense of something that's unraveling? And something unravels in order to clear a space for something new to enter. And the new that is entering may not resemble the past. It could be what we call discontinuity. Mm-hmm. It could be what you've named before as novelty. Mm-hmm. It could be the unusual. Yeah. The unusual is the presentation of, of life that, that has not yet been able to show up before. It isn't like, oh, this, it's weird, it's strange. It's just now this understanding and expression of being alive is possible. So we have to declutter. It goes back to defragging and decluttering, mm-hmm. uncluttering, creating the space. And we talked about the great reset number of episodes ago is that we're in the middle of this. So this podcast isn't, oh, let's pick a theme, Joey. Uh, what theme would be good to think about? Mm-hmm. We're not here to think about anything. We're here to be present to what's happening inside us, inside our humanity, inside the planet. And therefore, we have to be present so that I don't use my mind to imprison myself by creating these walls of belief that, that uh, literally wall me off from my, my fellow citizens. And therefore, how do we enter the commons? Space of grace, a collective space of grace, well, we can be here now together. Imagine showing up and everybody's quiet on X and just says, oh, let's, let's take the next half hour to listen to what's in the field, 
the field of our own human imagination, the planetary field, the cosmos, whatever. Let's listen. And as we join together like this uh, array of antenna, then we pick up something. What are you picking up? We don't do the what are we picking up in the moment. It says, this is what I think, this is what I believe, I don't agree with you. So we go back to this fundamental distinction between living a premeditated life and a meditated life. Mm. Right. That's the tricky transition. That's, for me, what it means to be here now. Yeah. And th that's an interesting perspective because it's, a, it's quite a shift. Um, you know, I was just thinking how when we communicate with people, how common it is to... Um, and I'm, I'm watching this happen right now with, with some with some family and friends that are going through some, some interesting things. And there's a tendency to always, you know, you want to make the other person an enemy or you want to make the other person wrong or make the other person um, invalidate their opinion. And then you wonder why you're constantly at this crossroad, like this loggerhead. So you know, one thing about being here now, like what if you, what if you were to instead um, validate the other person's, opinion validate their you know like give them the sense of good faith and as you start to peel those layers back you realize oh we're just you know all this stuff comes from these traumas these these injuries these things that we're carrying around with us and they keep us from literally just being in this moment with another human being you know and like and so i, I just i just i keep going back to this really wonderful experience i have every time i go to the, this grocery store here in town and there's one uh cashier that's there and we always have a great little you know two minute conversation and it's fantastic and and you know this has been going on for a couple of years now and and uh we've never once talked about politics we've never once talked about you know but you know if i were to go into that with like saying i need to make sure that you check all these boxes so that i can be nice to you you know it doesn't but that's what we seem to do with each other online well you know? see if we go back to the principles that we hold here at Meditation Mount, essential divinity doesn't say the divine lives in those people that only those people we like. Mm -hmm. No. Essential divinity means there's a spark of the creator in every human being, in every aspect of creation. Therefore, mm -hmm. everyone is sacred. We're just, we're just at different stages of revelation of that fact, of yeah. that truth. So we're not, we're not talking about proving a unified field theory. Mm -hmm. We are living in fi inside a unified field fact. Mm. It's the interdependence of the, of the human family and of the planet. In fact, we are in the two-month period here at Meditation Mount when we're focusing on the principle of unanimity, mm -hmm. which is all about coherence. Yeah. It's one of my favorite ones, actually. Yeah, the so. whole thing holds together. <laughs> yeah. Therefore, if we accept that that's what is, but in time and space, we have not yet realized it. We have not yet revealed it. So the time of the apocalypse is the revelation of the truth that lives at the heart of things. What has to be dispelled, dissolved, dispersed before that can happen? All the th things that we've held to be true before that are only representations of a truth, they are not true. Mm -hmm. So when I, I go back to your point, how do we greet each other? Mm -hmm. um, if I approach you and say, I hear what you're saying and I don't agree with you, I can say, look, um, I have a different perspective. What I'd like to know is how you arrived at this. Mm -hmm. What was it? Because I remember when I was working with groups, both in the corporate world and, and then in the nonprofit world and in communities, one of the things when people got agitated and, and, and really got on a soapbox and started to talk about something, I would say, I can hear that you have a deep passion and behind that passion is a deep concern. And I know that behind your concern is a value that you don't believe is being honored. What's the value that's not being honored that causes you this deep concern? Mm. Mm -hmm. So it's an inquiry. It's yeah. not finding out why they're wrong. 
And then this phrase that I've used for years is that we're here to inquire the way together. Yeah. That seems to be a, um, a very difficult thing for people. And is it because people are wrapped up in fear? Like if someone presents something that's going to, a piece of information that might rock their world or like, but because it seems like people are not curious, you know, about like what, what makes another person tick, you know, or what makes another person think this way? Like, um, and it's almost like if if they, it's interesting. It's like it's if they get any information that that will rock them, they're going to just fall apart. You know. Well, for me, it goes back to identification. Mm. If I am identified with what I believe to be true, then anybody that believes differently is not an ally. Right. Right. It can't be an ally. Yeah. And and therefore they must be an enemy. And so either I have to tolerate them, um, convince them that they're wrong, agree to disagree, but I am not at that level where I can say, hey, life is, here we are, what's happening in you, what's happening in me? Let's compare field notes. You've been alive on this planet for how many years and I've been on alive on this planet I'm in my 78th year now it's like so wh- let's compare field notes what have you what are you learning what have you learned through all your experiences distill it mm-hmm. what is it and then for me when I distill everything that's happened in me it's like don't judge listen mm-hmm. open the heart listen with the heart because the heart sees the unified field as a reality the mind sees the differences as the reality and the differences don't then become the unity and diversity the differences then become the divisiveness Mm. and and so at the moment i cannot see another if i don't see that everything hangs together when i see you i don't see you as another part of the kaleidoscope bringing a color and a shape and a luminosity that nobody else could bring. That if you weren't present, this wouldn't be present in the field. Until we see each other as essential and necessary, we, we're we not going to have respect for ourselves and each other. And I'm going to be tied up in my own understanding of who I am to a belief system, whether that be political, religious, uh, economic, Mm. Um, and therefore, what Roberto Assagioli does with his psychosynthesis, the spiritual psychological approach that he developed, and, and we'll repeat it again, he's the inspiration behind Meditation Mount, his big thing was disidentification. I have a body, I'm not that body. I have a mind, I'm not that mind. I have a job, I'm not that job. I am more. I am the one who works through my body, through my mind, through my profession. It is not my source of identity. It's my source of expression. And when your source of expression becomes your source of identity, when your belief becomes your identity, then all we see are friends and enemies, allies and enemies. And it divides quickly into two camps. Mm-hmm. Are you with us or you are you against us, Joey? Yeah. How can you have a, a with us and against us in a unified field? Right. And that, that's an interesting perception too, because um, you know, you're you're really putting yourself and other people in a box because uh if you if you look at it as, you know, being on like a, t- a teeter totter, you need someone on the other side to balance you. You know, it's like so if you're all on one side, you know, you're you're stuck. You know, so you're stuck. You're stuck in the ground, and um, I think that's one of the interesting things about simplicity and complexity. You know, like we we talk about uh, that. That's actually one of my favorite factors about the concept of unanimity, is that you get to play with the idea of something so simple, and then you get into the complexity of it. You now, well, this is where the simple thing is: there is one life. Right. The complex thing. Yeah. Is the one, as the Bhagavad Gita said, um, having pervaded the universe with a fragment, fragment of myself, yet I remain. That means the many, everything that is, is a manifold expression of one. 
So you've got this dance between the one and the many, the simple and the complex. And um, in the lineage that we come from, the Alice Bailey writings say, the further along you get on the path, the more you have to simplify your life. That doesn't just mean, oh, have fewer things. To It means simplify. And I remember those in, in Wizard of Earthsea, which is one of my favorite trilogies written by Ursula Le Guin, about a, a young mm -hmm. wizard in training. He says, as you tread the path, as you follow the path, it gets narrower and narrower until you, could own, you can only do what you have to do. Mm. The, 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 the variance and the wiggle room mm. disappear, and it's a razor's edge. Well, what's fascinating is that when that is actually happening in your life, because I know, I, because I've, I, I've known you now for a while and I've, I've been able to observe you, you actually... You actually walk this walk, you, you know that you you walk the walk, you talk the talk. You live you live a very um, simple but focused life, you know, and it's it's quite admirable. Like I, you know, I, I take a lot of inspiration from it. And as as I've watched myself go through this process over the last several years, you know, everything about our culture says to do the opposite. Everything about our culture is more, almost just for the sake of more. And when you start to simplify your life, it is a fascinating process. You know, like, but, but simplifying isn't just getting rid of stuff. Right. Simplifying for me is to realize I am a part of the one life. Mm -hmm. And then you, well, who am I? And then it goes back, well, who am I? Yeah. Well, I am life expressing through a soul, utilizing an incarnated instrument called Michael mm -hmm. for a number of years. Yeah. And, and that's not a clever way of, of, of keeping life at arm's length. It's, it's my way of holding the temporal and the eternal, mm -hmm. the simple and the complex. It's allowing me to be here now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I have to think of self, but my life can't be self-centered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... The <laughs> I, I have to think of the good of the whole, and yet yeah. if I don't have... If I'm not in touch with my own sovereignty and my own center... Mm -hmm then I have no place from which to give. Yeah. It's, this, it's this holding of both simultaneously, Joey, for mm -hmm. me. And then I go back to how do I measure success? We've touched on this before. Mm -hmm. You could say, well, before you used to be this, you, you, you earned this much money, you had this position in this company, you had the... No, those were classrooms. Those were ways in which I could give of myself, learn more about myself, learn more about my fellow human beings. It wasn't, it wasn't the spiritual ladder of conscious evolution. Mm -hmm. It provided the classrooms in which I could evolve. Mm -hmm. But having a high position inside a, you know, a Fortune 50 company, mm -hmm. for the time it felt like, well, it gave me an identity. And when I gave my business card to somebody, they were impressed. Mm -hmm. They were impressed. Yeah. Now, what does it mean to be impressed? We, we've said this before. Impression is the ability to be absolutely open without a conditioned field to receive the, the, the pulse of love that comes from the heart of the universe as purely as we can, that it imprints itself, it impresses itself upon us. And once we are impressed and we can express. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's the press is on. Yeah. It's a full court press, this life. I mean, this touches exactly <laughs> what my whole story is. I mean, I, I, from the time I was, my first memory, I wanted to do everything. I wanted to try and experience everything. Um, I had to do everything for myself. Uh, even as a young child, I, I had, I had to experience it all. And, I had to go through all of that, like all those classrooms. That's a good way of looking at it. I had all these opportunities, but it wasn't until, you know, just in the last five or six years where it became less about doing physical things, experiencing physical things, to changing and being about how how can I be more focused and then be more of service, you know? And and like and then you realize, okay, first you have to get your own house in order, you know, and that's and I think that's when you think about like uh, the simplicity, or or um, you know, we we you, you've often said the difference between being a minimal, minimalist and an essentialist. 
So in this part process for me over the past couple of years has been discovering what is absolutely essential to my to me to live an, like the kind of life I want to live, you know, and, and that for me is being of service and being of a net positive, you know, to the, to the right. field, you know. And that has nothing to do with quantity. Not at all. And that's, you, you have to, and as someone that was very successful and, but, you know, and, and moved in very, very exclusive circles and those kinds of things, when you, when you have to be like, okay, wait, that, that doesn't mean the same thing anymore because it can now be, having a great conversation with that cashier and like both of you walk away smiling. You know, that is a beautiful thing. Well, it goes back to the pain of comparison. If mm. I compare with where I'm at now to where I was before, and if where I was before in the eyes of society mm -hmm. was on the top of a mountain and I'm in some sort of muddy creek in a valley, <laughs> yeah. you know, it goes back to that identification. Right, but as soon as you said that, I was just thinking. But you know what? Sometimes in those muddy creeks in the valleys, where you find the gold, you know. Exactly. <laughs> so you know, it's, it's it's interesting how it all works because I I was I was completely and utterly frazzled and lost, but making lots of money and and, and doing and but really completely miserable too, you know. And like, and that's not to say that you can't make money and, and be happy. And it, but it needed it needed in my own life a great reset. You know, and I and I feel like kind of a little bit blessed, actually, and grateful that I went through some incredibly difficult, hard times, uh, a slightly ahead of when the world kind of started to wobble. You know, I, so I got to really work on myself and work on my foundation, so that right now I'm not quite as rattled as other people are. You know, and and I think that that's my opportunity to help serve, and if if nothing else, than just holding space and holding steady. You know. Right, because being here now isn't the same as checking out. No, right. It's exactly. checking in. Yeah. It's being present. Yeah. So people say, well, yeah, but you're not living in the r real world. You're at meditation. Mm -hmm. No, this is the real. In fact, this is the world of the inner reality. Um, of, of it's, a, it's a world of mindfulness, heartfulness, that if all of us were to live in a way which was mindful and heartful and caring mm -hmm. and we shared everything that we had, mm -hmm. the the society would be reconfigured overnight. Mm -hmm. It would not resemble the old. Right. Because the economic system wouldn't just be an upgrade, it'd be a new wiring. Mm -hmm. Because the current economic system has, a pi has pipelines that move around and feed certain parts and not others, and mm -hmm. there are droughts, and there, are, there is famine, and there is poverty. Yeah. The whole of the body of our one humanity is not being nourished by the systems we have in place at the moment. Mm -hmm. If we were truly to be here now, we would understand life is not flowing through the greater aspect of myself, which is my humanity. Mm -hmm. In the collective sense, I am one with my sisters and brothers. Yeah. That's the classic thing. Am I my, am I my brother's keeper, as it says in the Bible, or mm -hmm. am I my sister's keeper? And it's not a yes or no answer. The answer is, I am my sister. Mm. I am my brother. Yeah, that's one of my favorite uh, interpretations that, that, uh, that I've, I heard from you. So uh, I love that one because it's it really resonates in, in such an incredible way. Like you, because of course, if you take care of yourself, you'll be taking care of other people as well. You can't do one without the other. You know? Well, um, and we we've, we've referenced this quote before, but the spiritual teacher who was asked. Master, how do we treat others? The answer was, there are no others. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that that's one of those things, too. And, and it's when you're driving in traffic and someone cuts you off, it's hard to remember that. But it's important to to understand that, like, you know, everyone is going through their own thing and struggling. And every time that you don't contribute the negative energy you're making a net positive for everyone. Well, as you were speaking, I just had this phrase come in, road rage mm -hmm. is the toxicity of isolation. Absolutely. I, that, yeah, I mean, that's the same thing with being online. You know, you're, you're, you're forgetting that these are people. You're forgetting that, you know, and well, sometimes they're just bots, but, and that's its own problem. But, but even a bot is, is a, sort of a, you know, it's a collectivization of um, some you know, group identities and then, 
filtered through the worst possible denominations, you know? So, <laughs> you know, it's also one thing I've noticed. It's really easy to uh, parse sincerity when you aren't trying to uh, push your own agenda. And the way that manifested, has manifested for me is becoming less and less enamored with my own thoughts and ideas. And that doesn't mean I'm dismissing myself or I'm, you know, I'm playing myself. It's just really like, how enamored do you have to be with your own thoughts and ideas? Are they really that original? Um, are they that precious? And, you know, it goes back to being living in an examined or unexamined life. You know? and, and if I see myself as an instrument, it could be a musical instrument, mm -hmm. and I'm picking up the sounds of creation the music of the spheres, mm -hmm. and I'm interpreting it, I'm improvising, it's not me. My instrument is playing something greater than me that I'm part of. Mm -hmm. But when I think the instrument is the sound itself, mm -hmm. is the song itself, the instrument plays the song. Mm -hmm. How does Michael the Personality sing the song about my soul? Mm -hmm. and, and therefore... The only way is to be here now and uh, and to become Michael as the artist in resonance with the soul in the yeah. moment. Yeah. Well, I, I find it interesting. We had, um, you know, uh, we had Dot Maver on for an episode and she, she does the Global Silent Minute. And since, since that episode, each day I've been doing it. And it is interesting to see how, or, you know, it just so happens to fall at, 2 p 2 p.m. here on the West Coast. So it's right in the middle of the day, and I have my alarm set for 159 so I can prepare myself. But it's fascinating to watch, like it's really quite difficult to steady yourself and be quiet for a minute in the middle of the day. Like it's easy for me. I always meditate first thing when I wake yeah. up. No problem. But like to stop, put everything quiet at, at 2 p.m. and just sit for a minute has actually been more difficult than I thought it would be, which I, I find fascinating. You know. But the beauty of this of this uh, invitation is a collective training in how we can be here now together. Yeah. Not just be here now together with the us who are living on the on the planet incarnated, mm -hmm. but with those human sisters and brothers who are living in the subtle realms beyond the veil, as it's called. Mm -hmm. And as we spoke with Dot, we said that the, there is just life and consciousness, and either we're in the subtle realms in a subtle body, or we're on Earth in a slightly denser body called an incarnated body, or one made of flesh, incarnate. So the, the Global Silent Minute, for me, is a wonderful opportunity for, for all of the human family, whether it is living in the subtle realms or living on the dense physical planet Earth, to be here now together. Not just oh, so we, we feel good about being here together, so that we become this unified field through which life can express itself. Mm. It's never just there for our own enjoyment. Our joy comes from participating in the great, in the great uh, drama, mm. in, in, the, in the great um, choreographed, extravaganza called creation yeah <laughs> and that seems that seems grandiose and at the same time you you know i i was thinking of this song by the feelies called it's only life and i it's only life you know it's so sometimes we have to remember to breathe it's just life you know and, and uh, taking the temperature down is something that we can all do collectively i mean and you think like what can i do in my own life but I mean, if you if everyone only takes the temperature down a fraction of a degree collectively, that brings the temperature way down. And I think, and just I was just thinking about the terms of like you know driving and road rage and and online rage. If you can just walk yourself back off the plank just a little bit each day or each moment, man, like you know, in 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 a collective sense, that that really does move the needle. Well, to be here now, Joy. I have to liberate myself from the past. You and I, mm -hmm. are, with a lot of other people around the planet, have been working on liberating ourselves from past conditionings, whether mm -hmm. they be addictions, physical, emotional, mental addictions, where we're held fast by something, and liberating ourselves so we can be present. Mm -hmm. And being present 
means that we can allow the future to enter us. So the eternal now, the be here now, is the, it's, it's the temporal version of the eternal now. Mm-hmm. It's where the eternal now touches down in time and space. Yeah. Be here now. Mm-hmm. Be free of the past. And uh, I, I, yeah, everything <laughs> you say <laughs> is true. So it's, it's how do we stand in this space together And first of all, we have to agree that we're here to work together on a common assignment as part of a living planet. If we don't do that, we don't see the meaning. I don't understand what what my life's about. I don't understand. I don't care about your life. I don't understand what it's about. But if I understand that we as humans have a function within the planetary body, then we can start weaving together this and, 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 if you like, putting back together the dismembered body of our of our humanity so being here now is not being held by the pull of the past or the lure of a projected future mm. the, the future is simply the now that has not yet been revealed mm-hmm. yeah. and I, I also this popped into my head the way that it's played out. So there used to be sort of the um, the idea that you know to attain enlightenment you go away and you isolate. And I think that we've we're moving into uh, an era where it it is a group endeavor, right? which is one of you know, our pathways and principles. And I and I love that um, in group endeavor this idea of you know group meditation and whether you're just going to a group yoga class or you're going to you know you you have to do things with other humans and we're becoming more and more isolated and that's one of the things i do love about what we do here is we have these group activities and there is something about being in a room with a bunch of other humans and doing the same thing together and that's one of the things i like about the global silent minute is like i actually feel connected you know to all these people that are doing it at the same time and then when we have a group meditation, it's so different than doing it on your own. Like right. you, you pick up different energies, and and the more that you do it, the the more like um, you you become more open, but also you become able to narrow in on different channels. Well, you so. suddenly become more of who you are. Yeah. yeah. Remember, we said the we is an expanded sense of self. Right. Yeah. And, and that's it. What? And then not only that, I have friends that left the planet a few years ago, and I know some of them are part of the Global Silent Minute mm-hmm. every day. Yeah. yeah. I, I know because they worked on it while they were here and, and they were instrumental in this way of thinking. Mm-hmm. And the other thing about energy follows thought and being here now is when we tune into things, we said at the beginning, you know, all the signals that are going on at the moment, we often forget that we're like artists with a paintbrush and a palette of paints. Mm-hmm. And we can either create graffiti of the whole world or this 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 great artistic um, work. I remember a, f- a friend saying um, he was very sensitive and when he was in Los Angeles, he could see like these different bands of frequency and because they were being laid down and painted on, by the frequency of the thoughts of the people. Mm. The low, and it was like all these, like make six or seven bands you could tune into, which was reality. The lowest band was very dystopian and very, very, you know, lacked any hope. It was full of despair and it was dark. And if I felt that way and tuned into that, because energy follows thought and like attracts light, I would then say the future is dark. The future is bleak. Um, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. Mm. And then there are other layers, uh, like as you moved up the scale, more hopeful, until you got to a place which was more utopian than dystopian. It doesn't mean it was removed from reality. The fact is we create our own reality. As long as that reality then is in resonance with the reality that is life itself, which is not a belief. Mm. It, it's a beingness. It's a presence. 
And we're told that the closest description is the presence of love. Mm. What's the meaning of life? I remember there was a, a visitor, um, there was a family, and uh, uh, there was a young young person with the parents, and um, we were talking about um, you know, the, the meaning of life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and, and, as you do here. <laughs> as we do. And uh, we were talking about reason. And and I offered this because it felt like they were living with trying to figure out the reason. And I said, well, if you look at the French, the raison d'etre, what is the reason for being? And I said that when you look at the language that's used to describe love from the Venusian perspective, mm. the way that a, a, the, the filter of Venus um, articulates love is called pure reason. Mm. Pure reason has nothing to do with a mental state. Pure reason says the, the, the truest, purest reason for us being here now is love. And that's the great mystery. And the mind cannot comprehend it, which is why the heart has to open to receive it. Mm -hmm. And the heart has to open to register it. And the heart has to open to radiate this love. So being here now allows us to participate in this great circulation of being. And when's it happening? It's happening here. Where's it happening? It's happening now. Yeah. So Be Here Now wasn't just a great book title. It's a way of bringing our time-space coordinates in alignment with the eternal now and a bridge between the temporal and the eternal. Yeah. Yeah. And it's time for that. So that's a, I think that's a great place to, uh, to, to end up being. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm sure we'll have a specific, oh, next time, let's talk about this topic. Yeah. But the topic seemed to be the, the thing itself. Yeah. That we were experiencing. Yeah. Of, I'm drawing a blank. Yeah. And I, I think that's sometimes beautiful because you have to clear stuff out first. And, uh, yeah. you know, you, you start with the blank canvas. And I think I think for me, just um, because, because I am uh, sensitive, um, I'm still getting used to that idea that, that uh that I am very sensitive to energy, and you know, I've always known that, but like, you know, really wrapping your head around what that means, and 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 tending to that, and making sure that you're you're doing the self care you need to do, you know, all these things that I didn't really give much weight to before. Um, you have to take time to to clear the space, and you have to take time to uh, find some silence. You know. Well, Bucky Fuller said, "We hear as senses of the planet." Mm -hmm. Yeah. To, to register what's going on and, yeah. and, then, and then to give that information to the planet and be part of its outworking. Yeah. I, I, so in the midst of the storm, there is silence. In the midst of this political upheaval, there has to be a new opening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and when it reaches a point of tension, you can either collapse the field or you can open a space which is held by these two poles. Mm -hmm. a, a new space, a new opening. But the new opening can only happen if I see the principle of unanimity in action. If I see that we are all the many aspects of the one. If I see you as the enemy, then it isn't a holistic field mm. with, with diverse expressions. It's a divided field. Mm -hmm. yeah. And now we're living in a unified field in our mind. We're living in the divided field. Mm. Yeah, that's... Which is why we're having so much um, you know, mental issues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, uh... it's, 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 that is the whole illusion, isn't it? That's, that's the whole veil. And, um, you know, sometimes you have to wonder, like, well, could we even function without the veil, or would, would it be too much, or is that is that the purpose? But you know, when you really get down to it, oh man, it's just it's just about love. Yeah. It is, and it said that the the personality is the soul's defense mechanism against the cr encroachment of universality. Mm -hmm. So the personality <laughs> is the soul's defense mechanism 
about against the encroachment of universality, which means if we were to get it all at once, we'd blow all our fuses. That's right. The thing is, if it's our defense mechanism or if it's our filter, if the filter's contaminated, we're not getting a clear message through. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we've got a contaminated filter. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we've got to clean up our act in order to be here now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm such a fan of the Socratic method. And I, I feel like that's, um, I feel like asking questions has been kind of demonized lately in, in our culture. You're not supposed to ask questions. You're not supposed to inquire deeply about anything. And I think that just, it's so, um, it's an anathema to me. Like, but you have to have the right answers. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that helps. <laughs> you know, I've said this before. You can have a thousand brilliant answers to the wrong question. Yeah, that's true. And a, a, the question is an ion of quest. It's this quanta of energy that propels us into the unknown mm -hmm. for knowing to take place. Yeah. So the question, it you have to pose a question. Rilke said that. Don't don't worry about the answers. Live the questions, and then one day the questions will be revealed in you. They will answer. Ask and you shall receive. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Once you live into the questions, you invoke. And then we go back to the spiritual, this dynamic duo of invocation and evocation. Mm -hmm. You invoke, and by invoking something outside, it evokes in you the corresponding microcosmic uh, quality. But you have, you have to invoke it to evoke it. And you, you, you have to evoke it in order that it can enter. Mm -hmm. It goes back to a, dwell, a dweller in these two dimensions, but holding them together. Mm -hmm. It goes back to your point about we're living in a simple and a complex world. We are eternal beings currently inhabiting a temporal space, right. a dimension. Yeah. Yeah. So be here now is the crossroads. Yeah, that's right. This is where it lands, and this is uh, this is your time to be here. So. And I remember that when I was skydiving, there was always this cross <laughs> on the ground. You had to aim for the cross. I thought, God, how religious. Yeah. I remember I had a hard landing once, and mm. I went, oh, it's like, and you felt crucified. But it's like you aim for the center of the cross. Yeah. So being here now is standing at the center of the cross, which we've talked about before, the, the, the dynamic tension between the vertical and the horizontal. Mm-hmm. And out of that tension, something emerges. The portal opens at the center of the cross. And whether it's the rose emerging and blooming, as the Western mystery tradition, the Rosicrucians talk about, mm -hmm. or whether it's the, the light of matter being revealed as the, the story of the crucifixion and the resurrection, um, standing at the crossroads is another version of being here now. Yeah. So I guess this theme presented itself to us. And it, it, it's not so much a specific theme, mm -hmm. it's the theme of being. Yeah. Well, it's an opportunity. It, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a call. it's a call to action, and that action just happens to be standing, just holding that space, you know, embodying, embodying the love and the patience that's required to be here. And I go back to Global Silent Minute. Dot Maver always says, silence is action. I love that. <laughs> Maybe we I win at the moment silence. Yes, there you go. <laughs> well, thank you, Joey. Right. This, um, this emerged out of what was in the field. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so everyone take a moment. Take a moment and be here. And to be still. Mm -hmm. And I go back to Eileen Caddy at the Findholm community where I lived for many years. The eight words that she was given in her meditation that changed her life and changed many of our lives. Be still and know that I am God. Mm. Know means feel it in your total being. Yeah. Here and now. Yeah. And then do something about it. That's right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Joey. All right.